Thank you very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, Ukraine's president reaches out to the continent again. Vladimir Zelensky has a phone call with South Africa's president, Ramaphosa, about the impact of Russia's in invasion of its Eastern European neighbor. Also, Nairobi says it will host talks between the Congolese government and rebels that have been terrorizing parts of Eastern DR Congo. The announcement comes after leaders from across East Africa meet in Kenya to discuss the crisis. And park rangers in Burkina Faso have been coming under increased pressure from extremist groups. Patrols have had to turn to tougher measures as they face off the double threat of poachers and armed gangs. We hear from our correspondent in Burkina Faso. But first, South Africa's president said that he's spoken with Ukraine's leader on the phone to discuss the human cost and the global ramifications of the conflict in the Eastern European country. Cyril Ramaphosa tweeted that he and Vladimir Zelensky agreed that a negotiated solution was needed. However, South Africa's faced international pressure to shift from its non-aligned stance over Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Ramaphosa's refused to condemn Vladimir Putin's actions, and Pretoria is one of 17 African governments that abstained in a UN General Assembly vote in March to condemn Russian aggression. Eight others didn't record a vote, and Eritrea voted against the resolution. Ensipen Motema tells me more about what Zelensky was hoping to get out of the call with Ramaphosa. Before this call took place, there had been talks here in South Africa um, leading up to this call, particularly because the ambassador of Ukraine to South Africa had actually, um, when South Africa requested this uh, phone call, they felt that it was coming on a little too late. That was the first thing. And also that the request, the way that South Africa had put it, that they wanted this to discuss bilateral relations, um, the ambassador felt that it was too bland, that in a time of war, how can they be saying that they want to discuss bilateral relations, that they had wanted specifics from South Africa on what that call was going to be about, to be about and actually wanted to speak to the president. And uh, South Africa felt that was a bit um, undiplomatic on the uh, part of the ambassador. So by the time this call is taking place, there's already tension. The thing that Ukraine wanted out of this call, according to the ambassador, was for South Africa to to not be on the fence as how it's being termed by um, you know many countries, including the U.S., that South Africa's position on the conflict that is taking place in uh, Ukraine is that they have been on the fence. And so that the main thing was that South Africa needed to condemn Russia, not only that, that they were hoping that South Africa was going to use its influence um, on the African continent to try and, and, and lobby other African countries to also take that same stance, because they feel that to say that there needs to be negotiations, there needs to be peace talks is not enough, that an outright condemnation of Russia's actions is what they needed. So that's what Ukraine's hoping for. They've now spoken. Is this exchange likely to change South Africa's position at all? Not at all. At the end of it, the South African president has maintained what he has been saying for weeks, that South Africa's position is that they want to remain neutral. And the reason that they think that they want to remain neutral is that should there be an instance where South Africa is called upon to be a mediator, that they don't want to um, to be seen to have taken sides. When uh, the South African president spoke to um, Vladimir, uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia weeks ago, he, in he indicated that uh, Russia had asked for South Africa to be a mediator. So South Africa says that they want to remain on that position. And Sepeng Matema there for us in Johannesburg. Now, the death toll from South Africa's floods in KwaZulu-Natal province has been revised down to 435 from 448. The country's police minister said that though many people are still missing from last week's disaster, some of the bodies originally attributed to the flooding had died from other causes. Search and rescue operations have meanwhile continued. Many of those who've lost homes are struggling to find food and water. Doctors say that they're worried that the shortage could lead to outbreaks of disease. Meanwhile, the port of Durban, one of the continent's busiest and crucial to the economy, was severely damaged but has resumed operation this week. The leaders of Kenya, Uganda, Burundi and the Democratic Republic of Congo met in Nairobi on Thursday for an East African regional summit on the ongoing unrest in eastern DRC. Rwanda's foreign minister also joined the talks about the dozens of armed groups feeding into the crisis. 
Nairobi said that it will host talks between Congolese militia and the government with a consultation with some of the rebels planned for Friday. Bastien Renoui tells us more. It's the second time in two weeks that East African community leaders meet here in Nairobi in order to talk about the security situation in Eastern DRC. The first time was when President Felix Tshisekedi came here in order to sign the Treaty of Accession to the East African community. Why is it important to find a solution uh, to the situation? Well, because uh, many uh, rebel groups are targeting civilians and creating chaos in North Kivu, such as uh, the M23 or the Allied Democratic Forces. Uganda sent its army in North Kivu at the end of the year 2021, and they're still on the ground fighting uh, the ADF. I was with them a month ago, and uh, we were deep in the Virunga forest. They were trying to push them back towards a Congolese position. The ultimate goal is to create a road between the most important cities of North Kivu uh, and uh, Uganda in order to create and to improve uh, the trade relationships between the two countries. But uh, till now it's not working according to the head of mission from the uh, United Nations in Congo, uh, Bintu Nkaita. She says that between the beginning of the year and the end of uh, March, uh, 2,300 civilians were killed by uh, armed groups in Kivu regions. Um, so it's very important to find a solution according to the East African community leaders that are meeting here in Nairobi. We don't know yet how many times uh, they will meet in the future, but they say that in the end there will be a treaty uh, to find a solution to uh, the situation in Eastern DRC. Bastien Renoui there for us. Now, it's been a year since Chadian President Idris Deby Itno was killed in combat, leaving his son to succeed him. But as the 18-month transition period nears its end, little progress has been made towards achieving a national consensus to hold democratic elections. Laurent Berstecker talks us through. A year after his father's passing, Mohamed Idris Deby is sticking to his guns. The Chadian president of the transition says the electoral roadmap announced in July will be respected. Contrary to the predictions of social fracture and institutional chaos for our country, the transition has resolutely continued its year-long journey. When he was named head of the transition in April 2021, the young general immediately sacked the government, dissolved parliament and scrapped the constitution. Deby justified his actions by pledging to hold free and fair elections within 18 months and to launch an inclusive national dialogue for reconciliation. But a year on, these promises are looking increasingly difficult to keep. Peace talks between the government and some 30 rebel groups kicked off last month in Doha, but no agreement has been reached as negotiations seem to have hit a wall. A political impasse that's cast doubt on the government's ability to hold elections before the September deadline. In this context, the question of Deby's departure also remains uncertain. He has so far not excluded the possibility of running in future elections or of extending the transition period. Well, earlier this year, several park rangers were killed in a jihadist attack in a national park in Benin on the border with Burkina Faso. Sparsely populated, often poorly controlled, and sometimes straddling several frontiers, these protected areas have also become the target of jihadist groups. Our correspondent followed a team of rangers in the Nzinga Reserve in southern Burkina Faso near the Ghanaian border. He sent us this report. At first glance, these men could pass for Burkina-based security forces with their military uniforms and high-tech weapons. But this unit of patrol soldiers has only one goal, protect the environment and combat poaching. In a village, you can have an informer who informs us. As soon as he hears that there are poachers, he calls us and we arrive in the area. This area is the Nzinga Park Game Ranch a huge nature reserve of more than 100,000 hectares located in the south-central region, 10 kilometers from the border with Ghana. In this lush reserve, these are the special species in need of protection. This herd of elephants lives together with cobra gazelles and hartebeest, as well as crocodiles. The eco-guards play a crucial role in the protection of wildlife, especially since 2018, a new threat appeared, armed groups who poach to feed themselves and finance their activities. Since the start of the terrorist threats, we have observed that many species of animals are endangered in Nazinga because of the lack of surveillance. 
Despite some improvement over the past two years, insecurity has still had an impact on tourism. Visitor numbers have dropped from 6,000 to just 10 per year. Benjamin Bassono and his NGO are responsible for conservation and security. He says the park is now safer. In 2019, there were a few attempts to occupy the area, but the EU gave our NGO a lot of resources and we were able to quickly avoid insecurity in our area. Today, we thank God that we're safe from these terrorist activities. Here, we're totally safe. Our visitors are accompanied, secure and protected during their stay. It's hoped the newfound security will revive tourism in the Nzinga Game Reserve, home to the largest population of wild elephants in West Africa. A recent exhibition was held in Lagos spotlighting the work of autistic teens who've turned to art to better express themselves and relate to the world around them. It can be difficult for people living with autism to feel included and accepted by the communities in which they live. But for some, art does offer an outlet to connect through creativity. <laughs> for fun and recreation. Like every time when I come back from school upset, my art is the only thing that will make me happy. And, and I always use my imagination to use, to use inspiration of my art so I can bring it to a life. now because I've seen that there is something that we can do there's a path I mean like you know he his first ex 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 exhibition he sold 47 pieces and, and that was a big deal because he earned his own money you know and, and and for me that's important that you know that can be kept away from him you know for, for the future you know? That's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us and do so again if you can. Till then, take care.